I've had to follow a lot of things, but following the Declaration of Independence has got to be pretty hard. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of my, my background. I think it's a little different here. I'll start with a couple of things. The first thing I'll start with is I have done a lot of work in behavioral science. So part of what I'm going to talk about here is a little bit the contrast of artificial intelligence with human intelligence. That's going to be in the background. And the second thing is because I've done a lot of work on policy, I kind of come to this with the view that there are a lot of pretty intractable policy problems. So part of what I want to think about is how these things can play a role there. So I want to start with probably a very intractable policy problem. Uh, in the US, there are about 12 million arrests every year. And I don't know if you guys knew this. Before I started working on this, I didn't realize this. But shortly after arrest, uh, something happens. You go before a judge, and the judge has to make a decision fairly quickly about you. It's not about whether you're guilty for this crime. It's not about any, whether there's evidence. It's just whether, in waiting for trial, will you wait here, a very comfortable jail, uh, or will you be sent home? This is an incredibly consequential decision. It's consequential financially. There are about 750,000 people in jail every year. So if you just took a pure dollars and cents point of view, that's a lot of money. If you took a human point of view, a typical jail stay is about two to three months. In some jurisdictions, it's nine to 12 months. That's not a person who's been found guilty of anything. They're simply in limbo waiting. And that's insane. And we have both types of errors, actually. If you look at the amount of crimes that are committed by the people who were released while waiting for trial, that's also a shocking number. So why is this problem so relevant? It's at the epicenter of a lot of what we think about of crime. For example, people who look at mass incarceration, depending on how you count it, a large fraction of mass incarceration is jail. Not incarceration for crimes committed, but incarceration for waiting. Now, it's another problem because it's actually quite relevant for the artificial intelligence question. We've talked, I think you've heard a lot about prediction. You know what the judge is asked to do here? By law, they're asked to make a prediction. Will this person flee? Will this person commit a crime? Weirdly, the judge is carrying out the standard machine learning problem 12 million times every year in the United States. So if you just, I will skip the pictorial, but the judge is like a little algorithm of taking defendant history and outputting a prediction of crime. This isn't minority report, it's actually what we do. So you could ask the question, given all of the data, if a judge is executing this piece of code using the human brain, maybe an algorithm could do the exact same thing. Now, what's weird about all of this is these are all quantified. We, what are the judge predicting? Failure to appear. We know failure to appear because the person appeared or didn't. So what happens and how well does this work? Well, here's some data. Here's the predicted risk. And here's the release rate of judges. I think there's some very interesting, this is, a, this is from New York. This is about um, 750,000 cases. So this is our risk prediction on the x-axis by the algorithm. This is what the judge does to everybody in that bin. There are two areas that I find interesting here. The first is this area. This is where the judge and the algorithm agree. That is, risk is increasing and uh, basically release rates are dropping. Okay, so there's a large set of agreement there. This area is kind of shocking. There's, I would argue, let's just look at what this is. This is an area of very high release, about 50%. But yet the algorithm is saying these are people who are going to commit crimes at around a 60% rate. So they're extremely high risk individuals being released. And I think that's the first sign that something is slightly askew. So if you go back and say, what if we were to re-rank people by predicted risk and decide who should be released based on that? That might seem a little uncomfortable. But let's just see what happens. It's just data. We're not going to implement it. Well, something weird happens, which I think is part of what I want to come to my first theme, which is optimism, which is here's what would happen if the algorithm released nobody. That's on the left. If the algorithm released everybody. That's on the right. And this is the crime rate that would realize. So how is the algorithm doing? So here's a point I find useful. Judges release 73.7% of people. The algorithm at that rate produces about 8.5% crime rates. The judge produces about 11.3% crime rates. But you could go horizontally. If we're OK with society at 11.3% crime rate, why don't we pick this point off over here? And that point over here is an 84.6% release rate. So we could empty jail populations by about 41% of people and not change the crime rate. 
I'm raising this because I think we have every reason to be very concerned by these algorithms, but we have every reason to feel, if used correctly, there's an enormously optimistic potential with them, if used correctly. Why is this happening? Because if I put aside everything I know about machine learning and I pull in everything know, I know about human intelligence, human intelligence is enormously biased. We've talked about the bias of machines. Humans are crazy biased. This is a hard problem. If you've had 40 years of statistical uh, research on human decision making, these are the kind of problems we do badly at. What happens? Someone comes in and you say, do you see that guy, the way he was looking at me? That guy's going to commit a crime. What do you mean the way he was looking at you? That shouldn't play any role. So let's go further and you'll see the nature of human bias. Let's go back to racial bias here. And by the way, these effects are even bigger. I think machine bias is one of the most important areas. Let's go back to see what happens in this data. How big is the machine bias? Well, let's start with a benchmark. Amongst the people who come before the judge, the 48.7% are African American. Just, just take that, that could be very wrong. We could say there's lots of embedded, and we should, lots of problems in the criminal justice system, but that's fine. Let's just start with that number. Judges actually jail at a 57% rate. So there's a, African Americans face a much higher discrimination. But actually what the algorithm does is it jails at about roughly base rate. So actually, the algorithm is extremely good for African Americans. And in fact, if you want, you can turn up the dial. We can release down to about 40% African American. We can have about 40% jailing rates African Americans and not really affect the crime rate. Why is this happening? Maybe the algorithm's biased. In this case, it doesn't happen to be. But you know the one algorithm for which we have an astounding amount of evidence for bias? The one in your head. And so to the extent that we think that there's the potential for these algorithms, and again, this I think really pivots on doing it correctly. I think the potential is we have to think about these machines having a potential source of lots of bias benchmarked against the enormous amounts of problems within ourselves. So I want to close here on the rights and liberties um, aspect, which is I want to talk about this problem as being a different kind of rights problem that we should also pay attention to. And I'm going to do this by giving one example. The example is uh, from community college. My time's almost up, so I'll stop here. One of the biggest issues we have with economic mobility in the United States is uh, actually shows up at community college. A lot of people show up, they take classes, they drop out, they fail. It's actually very hard to get ahead. One of the reasons this happens is, imagine you're, you're, no one in your family has ever been to college. You get there, it turns out you're given a quiz on the first day. The quiz on the first day is, what class are you going to take? It's actually a really hard quiz. Do you take the advanced math class? Do you take the regular math class? Do you take the remedial math class? You may not realize it, but a lot rides on this decision. Take the regular math class, do badly. What do you start saying to yourself? Maybe I don't belong here. Why am I raising this problem? Because that student facing that quiz can go home that night and have the world's best data scientist help them answer the following question. How will I spend the next two hours of my life watching a movie? So that right is covered. But in deciding how they're going to spend the next six months of their lives, there's a guidance counselor on the fifth floor. So to me, the biggest problem right now we have in this space is that these things are being used for purposes that very much serve someone else's desires. I think there's an enormous potential for these things if they can be turned to serving the people that typically don't get served. And I think that's what I see in the jail example. That's what I see in the recommender system for courses examples. And there's endless amounts of such applications. And I think we really have the potential to do something fairly useful here. Okay, let me stop. Thank you.